Fantastic. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon and welcome, one and all, to Commit Happy Hour here on Friday, the 10th of July, um, with your hosts, Stuart Young and myself, Ian Miskimin. We are joined today to have a date with a robot. Uh, we are joined by Aviad, Guy and Max, who are going to talk to us a little bit more about robotics uh, and how that's going to have an effect and impact on our industry. So before we get into that really exceedingly interesting bit, I'm gonna hand you over to Stuart, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the happy hour and the productivity uh, improvements uh, initiative. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you, Ian, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, thanks to our presenter and panelists, um, Aviad, Guy, and Max. Um, before I get into the session, what it's about, um, I've got a couple of um, starters or introductions. The community, for those that don't know, um, it's a collaboration platform for owners, for contractors, for, for solution providers, and for research, development, academia. Um, we've been around for 17 years. We've, we've delivered project projects, we've delivered productivity improvements. Um, we are a collaboration platform that brings people together to uh, seek out solutions and deliver improvements. Um, you'll see a list of the members are around the left hand side there. Um, those are the people that are active. Um, this is, um, we set this um, session up, we've been delivering webinars now for a number of years, but we set this session up at the beginning of the lockdown in the UK and we've been doing them week to week. All the webinars that we've done so far are available on the Commit website. So anybody that wants to uh, look to see what we've done so far, everything is available. Um, there is a really good opportunity, in fact, several opportunities to ask questions. Don't hold your questions till the end. Um, if you want to raise your hand, drop a few questions into the box, um, please feel free to do so. We have, um, if we run out of time and uh, there is um, some more questions at the end, um, we have an opportunity to continue the conversation in the lock-in. Um, and we also have some poll questions, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but first, the Commit Productivity Initiative. Um, this is something we set up um, to help the industry move forwards. It looks at what productivity means to you as an individual or as an organisation. Um, it also examines whether you've got the means to improve your productivity. It looks at what else is out there. So other industries, um, you'll see a couple of examples of that today uh, with automotive and so on. Um, and how can it help you, us and the rest of the industry? Um, please contact me if you want to get involved with the Commit to Productivity Initiative and, and help create some enablement to move forwards in the industry. Um, so these are the areas that we're currently looking at. And the one that I've got highlighted is the automated job site. And I know that robotics cuts across a few of these, but um, we have delivered some several presentations now that, that look at um, several areas. In fact, we've actually been into project controls two or three times now. Um, but we are continuing round the circle, not necessarily in, a, in an orderly fashion. Um, but again, if you have any ideas, want to discuss something, want to share something, just get in touch. I'd, I'd love to uh, love to chat. Um, I'd like to say thank you um, to our sponsors, O2 Business and Rebim, um, for their support in, in helping these webinars happen. Without them, we'd uh, we'd, we'd struggle. Um, so thank you, thank you to those two organisations. Um, so our main session, we have a date, we have a date with a robot. Um, robots and automated processes will transform the construction industry. It'll improve, they will improve efficiency um, in, qu in quality and the workers' safety. Um, recent technolo technological breakthroughs enable an accelerated adoption pace and support for a wide range of construction workflows and processes. In this session, we will review related technology trends, we will discuss the challenges, and we'll explore current and future use cases. Um, we have a panel session, as you can see on the screen, we've got Aviad, our main presenter today from Trimble, we've got Guy German from Okivo, um, and we've got Max from Fulcro. Um, myself and Ian are on hand all the way through, we will keep any questions that you've got till the end. Please raise your hand or type them in the box. I'll ensure that they're asked at the end. And if, if we run out of time, 
and as I say, we've got a carryover opportunity. Um, I did say last week that I've not no curveball questions. Well, I've definitely not got any curveball questions this week. But what I have got um, is a number of um, poll questions that particularly relate to the session today. But before I get there, I've got a little video which um, follows this. Follows this, and if I just click on this, it should give you a presentation. It will help you with the poll question. So bear with me. It should start. It should start. But it's not starting. Yes, it is start. Technology is working. No. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> we may have lost Stuart's internet. Yeah, I think he's trying to upload something over um, his connection from Norfolk. Uh, and what can you say, really? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good idea, Stu. Um, so, Stuart. Share the link on the chat window, and people can have a look at that uh, at a uh, later date. I think we've uh, we've had that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not working. No. No. <laughs> Go straight into the poll questions. Unless your connection really has slowed that badly, Stuart. Can you get back to the presentation? Yes, Ian. Yes, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think your your internet is sorry about that. It's that's a bit better. Okay. So the first question I've got there is is how many how many robots are required to haul a truck? Ah, so if we watch the video, we'll be able to answer this one. So we just yeah, so that, that was the reason for the that was the reason for the video. <laughs> oh well, then. Um, I suppose it all depends on the size of the robot. I mean, somebody like um, Optimus Prime, there would only be one of them, really, because he's a truck in his own right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it looks it looks to be. Um, I think people are going down the right route here. I mean, if it, I'd have asked the question, what size is the truck? Um, you've made a good point about the size of the robot, but um, spot the dog. Um, just I'll just give it a couple more seconds. But um, okay, I think pretty much most people have voted. So can I share that on the screen now? Everybody see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. 58% said 10, 8% said 4, 17%, 16, 70% 2. Avia, give us the uh, give us the real figure. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess in this case, specific video, I was watching the videos. So I think it was yes. Yeah, in it well, I, I know what the answer is. It's 10. In in that video, it, it it's 10. That's all in that 23,000 um um 23,000 kilogram truck. Um, so yeah, ten. Okay, I'll just hide that and I'll let me, do, let me launch the next session. Next uh, question. So, what do you think is the main driver for robotics in construction? I should launch that now. So mm -hmm. we've got number one, aging workforce. We've got safety, um, quality, productivity gains. I guess it depends on who you ask. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one in the fact that. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it is completely. It would depend on who you're who you're talking to. I think none of them would admit to an aging workforce. Um, I think that's a uh, uh, I think that's your red herring there. Um, hmm. Overall, I think I'm going to go for safety because safety is one of our you know it's one of our top 
um, things within our industry is the one that is, is hammered home so very much um, uh, with zero harm policies and all sorts of things. So I, I think that's going to be the, the, the top one in our, uh, in our world. You see, I think I'd disagree with you on that one, Ian. I'd say it's probably productivity gains. Um, we are already a safety um, conscious mm. industry. Yeah. So driver behind robotics, ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay, I can see that, Max. I think actually, yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, I, I, I think you're right in the fact that we already have a very good safety record, probably not as good as it should be, but it's still pretty good. Um, and yeah. yeah, those productivity gains are the, um, uh, the number one. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you had any thoughts, Guy? I, I think productivity is certainly a major factor here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think aging workforce maybe is, is not the, the exact, maybe lack of skilled professionals. We see this a lot in places like uh, Japan, for example. Uh, yeah. So we call it just not just the aging workforce, just the lack of uh, professionals in the in certain areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, so the next question I've got is: What function during the construction life cycle will be the first to adopt robotics? You should be able to see that now. So we've got site investigation, we've got remote assist, we've got production work, layout assembly, modular offsite. Um, and maintenance work. I think as a barrier to adoption, um, site investigation is probably the lowest one to jump over with a robot. Um, yeah. The others require robots to be a lot more adapt at uh, doing many different functions. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of that layout and assembly would require a considerable investment in time and money um whereas site investigation i think as you say is is a low hanging fruit it's very easy to to sort of pluck out um i guess the reason product work is so high is because uh if it can if robotics can be used to replace repetitive tasks that run the risk of rsis or monotony that will extremely low skilled labor um so that we can deploy a human on a more challenging task that a robot can't be applied to i i, I guess that's why production works so high yeah it's a bit like sure. car factories um you've got those robotic arm that will do all the welding because it repetitively does the same thing over and over and over again improving quality um yeah yeah i like that so the final question, thanks guys. The final question is, um, how do you see the future of work? It should have launched now. <laughs> well, I don't think I've ever found a human being that can manage me. So um, I highly doubt I could find a robot that would do it. <laughs> robot, robot the future uh, how far is this future um, i think short term it's number two uh, longer term things will change more dramatically also I guess it depends what you consider a robot are we talking any artificial entity or are we talking a mechanical object that can manipulate and change things because otherwise point three could be uh, could be a bleak future yeah. yeah yeah i think that's uh i, I think that that covering the social tax is quite interesting whether because we're not just looking at robots here in the construction world but also in the manufacturing in the fabrication in the um the the the, the social and, and the um oh the oh, bars, okay. bars of work for you know the shopping and things like that type industry um and if that comes to a point we'll get to a time when all those type of jobs will be robotic and what how, how do we you know how do people fund themselves how do people earn money if those jobs aren't available so i think that's a that's certainly a very long-term societal question that last one yeah yeah absolutely 
Just, okay, thanks, just Ian. Any outside yeah, construction on. that last one, the social payments, there have already been riots in the USA over the amount of robotic workforce and things such as the Amazon warehouses, and people are very concerned over low-skilled jobs already disappearing. So whilst it might be a long way away in construction, we're going to start seeing um, human rights versus robotics uh, and companies' rights coming to a head within the next five, ten years, I believe. Yeah, I suppose we've been through that once before, what, a hundred years back when the first industrial revolution was coming along uh, and the Luddites were, were smashing the spinning jennies and, and, and the like because they saw them as, as a threat to their livelihoods uh, and the way that they could live as such. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay, thanks, thanks guys. Um, I'm going to move on now to the next part. I'm going to introduce Aviad. Um, Aviad is the uh, leading emerging technology um, lead at, uh, at Trimble uh, with a focus on disruptive tech um, such as mixed realities, robotics, AI, uh, quantum computing, and brain computer interface. Um, Aviad specializes in deeply frustrating. Um, though, though highly rewarding domain, um, introducing and implementing emerging technologies in enterprise markets. Not a job for the faint hearted, he says. His role requires flexible stubbornosity. Not used that word before, but that, I'm going to use that from here on. I think that fits very well with that introduction. Um, he's very knowledgeable. Um, <laughs> it requires ignorancy, acrobatics, and mental agility. And Aviad holds a master's degree from Cambridge, um, an MBA from Harriet Watt, and a BArch degree from the Israel Institute of Technology. So, Aviad, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for putting this session together. Um, really looking forward to it. Um, just bear with me one second while I transfer to yourself. Uh, where are we? There we are. Okay. It's all yours. Over to you, okay. Aviad. Thank you very much. Um, let me know when you see my screen. Just a second. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. And I will remove this video. Okay. Um, is the video running? Yes. Yes. So please feel free to shout if there is any issue with the audio or the video. Uh, what you see here, uh, about a year ago, I asked my engineering team to um, explore what are the major benefits of robotics in construction and this is what we came up with um, <laughs> quite an interesting use case uh, since then in the in the last several months we developed a few other um, valuable use cases and I will go through them during this uh, session um, which is really about um, a date with a robot if you will uh, but before we dive into this um, one minute about Trimble, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the company, a global company, about 13,000 employees, 3.5 billion annual revenue, and five major industries, buildings, heavy civil, agriculture, transportation, and geospatial, uh, about 50% hardware, 50% software. Um, and um, if you'll think about hardware side, it's, uh, it's sensors, scanners, uh, total stations, um, IoT devices, machine control. On the software side, it's typically end-to-end -end solutions uh, for the industries we serve. So taking buildings, it will be design tools like SketchUp and Spectra Structure, it will be construction management, and it will be uh, uh, owner's portfolio management tools. One of the main goals for us is uh, merging together the digital and the physical as a means to improve productivity uh, and uh, quality of work. Uh, that's a focus for uh, most of the business units and part of this digital transformation that the industry is uh, going through. And as for my uh, team role, as Stuart mentioned, um, my team is dealing with emerging technologies, typically early phase technologies where we set a vision, and goals, and work with a business unit, but more importantly with visionary customers uh, to validate our assumptions, identify the gaps, and bring the technology to a state where it can be consumed by the business. So if we will look at uh, our uh, portfolio, talking about mixed reality, we started about five years ago. Today we have hardware solution like the Trimble XR10 for Holland's 2 or the Trimble Side Vision, 
which deliver augmented reality and mixed reality to the construction workforce. And we have related software solutions to support it, like Trimble Connect or SketchUp Viewer HoloLens. And in a similar way, we believe that robotics is the next in line, and we would like to push this technology forward in a journey that will bring us to a state where we will start to see actual commercial solutions around robots. Other technologies on our portfolio are quantum computing, um, optimizing processes, collaboration with Microsoft, quite interesting, but a bit uh, down the road, and brain-computer interface, which is really about the uh, ability to control the future environment, which we see as a mix between hardware and so sorry, digital and physical, controlling, for example, a robot like Spot or a bulldozer with your brain, but also controlling all the digital assets that will be surrounding us in the environment. So we were looking for different way to interact with data uh, and with the physical assets and the brain computer interface is certainly a promising one. We can actually already today control a robot like Spot with our brain. Uh, it's a different discussion, different topic, but certainly an exciting um, journey. So that's about us. And uh, back to the robots, actually the discussion today will be about the overarching vision, which is automated workflows, not necessarily the robot uh, specifically. The robots are, are an important tool of this, an important component in the bigger vision, but we believe that the real values, the real uh, benefits will be in the automated workflows. That's where we can transform the industry. So our vision for robots is part of this automated workflow is that uh, soon and a few years from now, we'll see robots working side by side with humans, what we call cobots, uh, because they collaborate with humans and they also collaborate with other robots. And when I'm saying robot on the broader kind of uh, spectrum, uh, we can talk about robotic cranes, we can talk about drones, um, robotic uh, dozers, and of course, this kind of fancy four leg robots as well. So different types of robots working around together with humans in order to improve productivity, safety, and quality. That's basically the vision uh, that we have. And this vision is, is based not on just our gut feeling, it is based on what we see as emerging technologies which support this, and I will describe them later on in more detail, but also on our understanding about what's going on in other industries. And looking back in, the, in, in, in construction, uh, 3D modeling was not started in construction, started in other industries like uh, industrial design and production and, and uh, manufacturing and, and moved into the construction space as well with BIM, for example. Uh, and if we're looking today at the automotive industry, uh, which is of course more advanced concerning robotics, we can see that about 60 to 70 percent of the production process is already done by robots from trimming, assembly to welding and so on. And the drivers behind this are safety, productivity and quality. And I think that if we look at our industry construction, we can sign today on improving safety, productivity and quality. So uh, there is a lot of parallel line between the two. Now, talking about productivity as an example, a company from Australia, Drake Trailer, they report uh, just on the welding section of the production, 60% increase in productivity by using uh, robotic uh, technology. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, in a way, unfair comparison. The, the automotive environment is much more um, adopted to robots. Uh, there is a you know, kind of a clean area without humans moving around. The production line is actually moving to support the robots. The robots are bolted to the ground. So kind of easier to imagine how those robots can work um, in, in this environment compared to construction. But with advanced technology like AI and computer vision, we can start to see already in the market um, a change in this environment. Actually, what we call cobots working side by side with humans. Uh, anticipating and calculating their trajectory and their expected movement and of course being able to respond dynamically to this and in this way we can get the environment where robots and humans work together and robots actually augment the capability of the human and uh, improve the safety and the quality of the world and also here we can see the, the um, productivity gain by using this kind of environment and the result of this improvement, AI and computer vision and advance in robotics, actually shift the focus. If in the past, most of the industrial robots were basically allocated in the automated industry, 
Now we see a shift with more than 50% of robots going into other markets like medical or defense or manufacturing, or mining and retail. In fact, with retail, um, and we can, we can talk about uh, productivity uh, kind of expectation. Uh, for example, this Boston Consulting report talking about 30% uh, uh, improvement in productivity uh, using robots in the industry. And Amazon, uh, as Max mentioned earlier, they report 300% productivity gain by just placing uh, robots in their warehouse. So what about construction? Why we are so late? Um, there might be two reasons. One, we already got the numbers. We are productive enough. We don't need this type of technology. Um, and I, I don't think this is a, this is a kind of a, a good predic a pr a prediction. Uh, the other reason for being late here uh, to justify this kind of uh, approaching late to this technology, construction sites are more complex, they're especially complex, they're unstructured, um, ever-changing, and a hybrid environment with humans and machines and robots, it is a complex place for robots to work. But as I mentioned, technology is progressing, and to put it kind of in a, in a simple um, split, we can see already two types of robots in the market. On the right side, specialized robots, like the robot from Okibo doing painting or, or plaster work, uh, or the robot from Dusty Robotic doing layout and, and marking the, the layout uh, on, the, on the ground, supported by a total station. And on the left side, we see more generic robotic platform, which is supposed to take any payload that you would like to, um, to use in order to perform some tasks. And I know this is not the only way to split the market, but this is an interesting one. And we can already see some overlapping um, kind of uh, robots which do both. But when we talk about the, let's talk the, about the right side, those specialized robots like Okibo, those robots are designed to deliver a very specific task. And in this case, what you see in the video, you know, scanning the environment, comparing to a BIM model, understanding the surrounding, and basically designing a path for the robot to go through and optimize the, the painting or plaster process and deliver at the end of the day um, the required quality. And in this case, um, it's quite straightforward to say, hey, there is a productivity gain, here there is an ROI, and I'm sure Guy can provide more information about his experience with customer uh, with this type of technology. On the other hand, with a uh, more generic uh, uh, robotic platform, it's really about delivering something which can cope with the uh, uh, kind of unstructured environment, navigating this environment, carrying a payload uh, in this environment and delivering the specific type of task that the, the user would like to deliver. So it's a slightly different focus from those two types of robots. In fact, we can say that those generic robotic platforms belong to a new breed of robot, what we call bio-inspired robots, which are designed to work in an unstructured environment like construction or mine or oil and gas, or in this case, you can see other uh, more, even more challenging environments. So let's go back and talk about our overarching vision. We're talking about basically automated workflows and how robots can be part of this vision. And we do, we do see two separate and connected uh, streams of development. The first one is about the robotic platform, how we can fully automate the process. And uh, what you see in the picture, uh, based on trivial autonomous technology, those Caterpillar machines include, um, if you can see here, the, the GPS technology, uh, the gene has to provide position and orientation, uh, and actually track the movement. Uh, we have Trimble technology to support the steering and machine control. So those heavy machines in construction, in mining, in agriculture can move autonomously. There is a driver still there, but they can actually move autonomously. It's a different story with robots like Spot that we, we saw earlier, where we are in a kind of a mix of remote control, semi-autonomous and autonomous, and I will provide more details later on. But certainly our goal here is to have a robot waking up at 6 a.m. in the morning, going through a tour in the site, perform the job, and back to his dog uh, house at the end of the day. Uh, delivering the information or the task that it was supposed to complete. We're not there yet, but that's where we would like to go. The other stream of, uh, of uh, development is about automating the output, especially if we're talking about collecting data. Uh, how we can move from just descriptive type of information to predictive and prescriptive. 
Just as an example, imagine the robot walking on site, collecting data by, by uh, using scans or 360 images and providing predictive and prescriptive output for the superintendent. For example, uh, comparing to the 4, 4D uh, B model, we are late. And if you will move to three shifts uh, uh, kind of uh, a day, you can close a gap. Or if you would prioritize specific trades, you can close a gap. So this kind of information, which is suddenly based on machine learning and AI, will deliver better output for the users and not just the raw data that you can uh, use and start um, uh, making decisions based on. The good news, we are in a pretty good position and uh, I'm presenting here Trimble, but it's not necessarily just Trimble. We have information in the field. We have sensors in the field that collect data from GNSS to drones, to IoT devices, to stationary cameras, scanner, total station, humans with equipment, everything we need to collect and understand the, the data or understand the site and what's going on on site. We have cloud solutions to aggregate this data and we have the application on the other hand, like logistics and finance and operations to consume the data and as an output, uh, help the user get decisions. What we need, what is missing is automate the process between those three components as much as we can. And uh, what we are doing now with robotics and with this spot uh, robot, uh, we just put one payload or two payloads on top of this robot and we'd like to check this workflow and evaluate where are the gaps and what are the benefits that we can already deliver with this type of technology. Assuming that if we do it with one part of this bigger vision, it would be possible to do it with the rest as well. So why did we pick Spot for our um, evaluation? Um, when we analyzed the market, uh, it was clear to us that this specific four-leg robot is the best available in the industry for four-legged robots. Uh, quite uh, ruggedized, terrain agnostic to some extent, and spatially aware, meaning it can cope with the construction environment, with this challenging, challenging environment. Uh, and the example here in this video just show you the uh, ability of the robot moving around in a construction site. On the bottom right side, you see the close range spatial understanding, which helps with the uh, collision avoidance. And on the bottom left, you see the um, map that the robot creates uh, to itself in order to better understand where it is located. So with this, uh, we can connect the payload and start delivering uh, some meaningful workflows. And the essence of the partnership between Trimble, Hilti, and Boston Dynamics is about how we create one integrated solution which will deliver value to the industry, which will support actual construction workflows because the robotic platform as is, is very exciting, but cannot do much on the vertical, specific vertical workflow construction. The top part, the, the payload, cannot be automated in a way uh, to support what we need. So we would like to get an integrated solution to deliver uh, um, better and more um, kind of uh, a smooth workflow. Now, Spot is designed as a platform, meaning it is designed to carry pay payload and if needed, can provide power and communication. And on top of this spot uh, platform, we can place any type of payload based on the requirement in the specific use case. Uh, in this case, you see uh, a Trimble X7 scanner with auto leveling, and I will describe it later in more details. You can see Trimble R12 uh, GNSS receiver or SPS996 receiver, or even a total station like this RPT600. They're all potential payload depends on the task it would like to deliver in the field. Looking at the potential use cases of this type of device, um, we can look at it in short term, long term, or semi-autonomous, fully autonomous. Um, certainly a journey that we are uh, starting now. And already today we can deliver things like production control and quality control using the scanner or mapping using the, the GNSS receiver. Um, or layout using uh, a total station with different uh, value propositions. And in the future, I'm pretty sure using dedicated um, uh, payloads like this robotic arm from Boston Dynamics, uh, we can we'll start to see production assist, production and, and maybe material handling. And talking about production, you can start to see the blurring line between the two categories I said, the archival type of robots which are really specialized 
the unspecialized robot-like spot, and then, then there are some things in the middle. So let's talk a bit about what we can actually do today. And uh, talking about scanning, and we picked this, this specific scanner because it includes auto-leveling capability, which support automation, meaning I don't care if uh, the uh, tripod, or in this case, spot, is uh, leveled. The, the software-based uh, leveling can compensate for this. Um, and with this kind of solution, I can do as built, document the as built environment, or do production control, or do quality control, or even the formation of, of checking for deformation. For example, we have customers in Japan who are interested in identifying deformation in tunnels underneath a, a dam for safety reasons. So what you see in this video, uh, the green line, green light meaning the robot is now scanning, the blue light, sorry, now scanning. When it's done, green light, and it is communicating with the robot. Remember, it's an integrated solution, telling the robot to move to the next point. The robot will move to the next point fully autonomously, bypassing obstacle or humans on the way. And once it arrives to the next point, it will stop, communicate with the scanner, I'm here, waypoint two, please do a scan. So it's a communication between the two, which is part of this integrated solution. There are other aspects of the integrated solution, but this is one which is pretty clear and visible in this video. So I mentioned this is an autonomous workflow, but not fully, because if we'll go into the details, what was uh, required in order to support this autonomous workflow is uh, kind of uh, pre-educating uh, the robot about the path. So taking the dog to a walk and clicking on a button everywhere you want to have with a, with a, with a kind of controller, everywhere you want to have a waypoint. While doing this walk, the robot basically stores a mission and identifies the environment. So next day or next week or next month, when you go to the same location to the starting point, you can basically initiate mission one and the robot will go through this same path and will uh, scan the environment. You will be able to see the output almost in real time uh, immediately after the, the robot finishes the first scan and the other scans will join once they are done and you will get them stitched together automatically on your tablet. Again, we're talking about automated workflow. And this data can be then consumed by more specialized application to do point to point, uh, point cloud to point cloud comparison or point cloud to BIM comparison to identify any discrepancy. Talking about again, the automated workflow, the data can be, which is stored by default on the scanner is transferred by Wi-Fi to your tablet, but can also be transferred to a cloud solution like Trimble Connect, again, in order to uh, deliver almost real-time understanding about what's going on on site and improve the efficiency of the um, analysis of the data. So this is about scanning uh, and the ability of use of, of the kind of uh, the use of robot with a scanner and what kind of benefits are there. The second use case is about um, using the robot with a different payload. And by the way, those payloads can be switched easily with a quick release here. Uh, but this payload is about uh, um, a GPS or a GNSS receiver. Um, the SPS-986 you see here is a pretty accurate uh, uh, GNSS receiver. And since Spot has no internal GPS, it enables Spot to navigate in an outdoor environment without a problem. So once you have the coordinate, you can uh, support navigation. You can measure ground level in a very accurate way. For example, when you have earthwork project and you want to compare the design of the levels to the uh, actual and uh, approve the work of the subcontractor. Um, and you can e even do mapping. There's a system uh, constantly collects the data of the, uh, from the GNSS so we know exactly what the height of the, of the um, surface and then create a mesh, which is basically a topographic map of this field. So what you will see in this short video, the robot is guided by the GPS. When it arrives to a point, it will do a, a kind of a small kind of gesture, I'm here, and then move on. And in this kind of small gesture, when it arrives to a point, we can decide to do other actions. For example, take a 360 image to get georeference data or any other um, measurement that you would like to deliver in this specific place. The way it works is basically constantly comparing the uh, absolute coordinate coming from the GNSS reader and the spot world, meaning the, the robot is basically constantly 
fixing his small drift in order to stay in the corridor that we defined for it uh, along the path. So with this set of use cases, we felt that we are ready and actually started to explore uh, the potential of robots uh, with payload with our customers. And actually, we, uh, we um, uh, initiate an early experience program which enable customers all around the world to join and basically explore the potential. Uh, one of the first was a, a company called Hansel Phelps, so one of the largest general contractor in the US. Um, and this, what you see in the picture is at Denver Airport. It's, uh, I think, the, uh, among the largest airport in the world, I think 15 largest airport in the world today, an operating airport where they had to renovate the uh, main terminal. And a critical aspect for them was to get an accurate as deal in order to compare to the design to avoid any delays afterward once they start the construction work. So they were using Spot with an X7 scanner that you see here to measure the environment and basically run this uh, automated workflow. And you can see on the bottom left side in this specific section of the terminal, they did 11 uh, uh, scans. The scans were stitched together automatically and being uploaded to the cloud in order to do a comparison on any special application that you would like to use uh, for this specific purpose, identifying any gaps. Um, that's basically the way we see the future. And we, will, we believe we'll see more and more robots uh, in the field working side by side with humans, delivering this type of work, which are repetitive, dull, dangerous, um, and where robots can actually excel. Uh, freeing the humans to do more complicated um, tasks. So I will uh, end here and I'm happy to answer any additional questions or talk about any other topics that you are interested in regarding robot. And Stuart, I think it's time to move it back to the panel and, and discuss questions. Sure, thank, thank you very much, Ariad, for that. That was tremendous. Um, my, um, my experience of, of robots is um, was, is now vastly improved on what it was. Um, I have had quite a bit of involvement with um, semi-automated um, operations in, in projects, but um, that just takes it to a whole new level. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Guy, and, and, and thanks to yourself as well for supporting, and, and Max for coming on. Uh, let, me just, um, let me just move back to take control if I can. Um, one second. Okay, so can everybody, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yes. Everybody see my screen? Okay. Let's go your desktop now. Right. <laughs> you got the desktop. Okay. Can you see my? Can you see my screen? Share yes. my screen. Oh, yeah, you're back. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, so, um, Max, I'll introduce you first. Um, we've already had Aviad, we've introduced Aviad. So, Max, um, Max is Director of Full Pro Applied Technologies, um, and Max is also a Chair uh, for Technology at Commit. Um, Max is a, is a computer scientist that builds cutting edge um, reality simulations for Fulcro and its clients. Um, Max has some specialities in mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, 4D visualization, um, software robotics and development. Thanks for joining us on the panel, Max. Um, and a little bit about Guy. Guy um, is the CEO of Akibo and he's, and he's present here, I think, through the questions that we've got. It's doing some pretty amazing stuff in this field. So um, I'm sure Guy will, uh, will share a few uh, a few uh, bullets which, um, that, that uh, will amaze us, as Aviad has already. Um, so I've got some questions. Um, and the first question I've got, just bear with me a second. The first question I've got is the role of robotics in digital transformation. What is the role of robotics in digital transformation? So um, Abia, do you want to take that question first? Would, would you mind? Uh, and then maybe we'll bring in Guy and, and Max. After. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I, I think you know the digital transformation have two aspects. One is really digitizing our processes, 
uh, but then not less important, connecting this digital process into the field. And like other things, robotics can play a dominant role here. So they can actually, for example, use a BIM model, uh, an accurate representation of the physical environment in order to improve their special understanding and vice versa, collect data from the field and update the BIM model that is um, kind of uh, up to, always up to date. So I do see a um, kind of um, a symbiotic relations between um, digitalization and robotics and BIM or even digital twins uh, in this specific case. Th thanks. Um, any, anything to add to that, Max? So um, the way I see robotics in construction, um, I, I see it more as a technological assistant to the existing operatives on site. I, 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 I shudder at the idea of robotics running things. Um, despite being a roboticist myself, I, I do like to think the human is in control. Um, but where I see things uh, going is the idea of Tevi manipulation. So if there is a dangerous environment, being able to remotely control an operative or machine, um, whether this is a teddy handler or a, uh, say, a bump stid skearer or a backhoe in dangerous environments. So um, we're seeing a lot of uh, uses for robotics in disaster recovery. Say we've had a structural failure, being able to pick through the rubble and the ruins safely at a distance without exposing an operative to danger. Um, but equally, helping humans. Um, one of the things that uh, I did some research on back in ooh, the early 2000s was being able to share, say we have a large I-beam girder, which I'm going to represent with this pencil, being able to have a human controlling two robots to be able to carry it safely across a job site without having to then bring in an overhead crane can help with uh, the, the speed and uh, accuracy of positioning materials on site. So there is a lot of potential use cases for robotics. Um, nice thing with Aviad's presentation is it showed the breadth of where it could be used. Um, so the world's really the, uh, the robot's oyster, shall we say. It's just uh, finding where it's going to fit within the construction process that's going to help with the digital transformation. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, Guy, any thoughts on, on that? Would you like to add anything to what uh, Aviad and Max have said already? Yeah, I think uh, Aviad mentioned the dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs that uh, robots uh, require to automate. But uh, I just want to mention that it doesn't mean necessarily that the jobs, even though they're dirty, dull, and dangerous, are simple jobs for, uh, for people. And some of the jobs that can be automated are in the realm of uh, skilled professionals, uh, um, prof uh, jobs that, and robots can actually today with the uh, current technologies and, and hopefully future technology will be able to uh, do a really sophisticated and uh, uh, professional work within the construction industry. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. Um, I've got some questions. I've got a question come in. Um, really interesting insight to, into to the world of Spot. How long does his work day battery last? And that's from Steve Crossland. Um, mm -hmm. Aviad, would you like to answer that one? Sure, Spot today is, um, uh, can work 90 minutes, 9-0, uh, with a battery. There was a, it's a very easy to switch batteries, um, 10 seconds work, uh, but the capacity is for 90 minutes. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, next question I've got is a um, um, fascinating um, session. At what point do you think the price point will make this technology a no-brainer for construction? It's a tough market. Perhaps the retrospective digital twin market is an easier market to crack. Use cases and, um, just a second, I've lost the last part. Use cases and value, value stories are king, right? Question mark. Aviad? Yeah, I, I think it's a clear, you know, it's an enterprise market. and I think it's a clear um, ROI question uh, if we take you know, if we'll not consider the marketing power of this technology as well. Uh, I can already see the value in our early experience uh, kind of uh, program uh, when user control robots and get the data uh, um, quite often or often than they had before that. I think that with a specialized robot like Okibo, 
and maybe Guy can uh, can um, uh, provide us some insight here. The uh, ROI is much easier, easily is easy, easy to measure in a way. So um, maybe Guy, you can you can provide us some insight. Yeah. Uh, so so first of all, I think that uh, uh, our robot is uh, maybe specialized application robot, but the actual uh, platform hardware and software is general purpose. So we provide uh, actually a platform that can do numerous applications within the construction site. Uh, so our first go-to-market is uh, drywall finish, and the ROI is very easy to calculate because drywall finish on, on average uh, costs around $10 per square meter, and uh, let's say we sell the robot for 150 k that means that after uh, 15,000 square meters, if you don't consider the operator, which is a, a low-cost uh, operator, usually within the, the, actually t the actual team that does the, the, uh, the drywall finish, then it's uh, up to 15,000 square meters, which is a relatively small, medium-sized project, you get back your uh, return on investment. Uh, it can vary between uh, uh, even four to five months in some cases, and uh, maybe up to a year. So uh, our eyes uh, is very clear here. Okay, thank you. Um, I presume some data kicking around that we could we could have a look at is the guys. Have you had, is that, is that something that, um, you know, that, that somebody's done some studies on? About our eye? Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, at least on our side, this is an early phase and we are collecting data, um, but um, it's not yet something uh, solid or scientific that we can um, communicate. It will take uh, okay. time to get this. Yeah. One of the and, and very I, I rapid, sorry Stuart, um, yeah. one of the very rapid areas that you can realize ROI is if you don't just consider the cost of labor, is if you consider the cost of safety. Um, so in the case of subterranean tunneling, um, and we're seeing some large infrastructure projects in the UK, things like Crossrail, Thames Tideway, where you're using things like um, tele-robotics for doing shockcrete spraying onto tunnel linings. If you were to have a human operative physically adjacent to that operation, the risk to their health and safety, and therefore the mitigation of that risk um, costs far more than installing a robotic platform that's tele-operated by the same operative. So in yeah, a sure. case like that, the return on investment is far outweighs the cost of having the robot on the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fully agree. Yeah. And what I, we had in, um, in South Africa as a, as a customer from the mining industry where they want the robot to enter to a blast area to do measurement and they cannot actually send humans um, to this area in, in, in a similar way. They need to wait for 24 hours before they can do it. So certainly a, a, an advantage from the safety point of view. I agree. Equally, if you're going to environments like offshore mining or uh, deep sea wells, being able to use a ROV or a remotely operated vehicle to do the deep water inspection saves having to put a diver down into that environment. And even some of these deep water wells are too deep for traditional diving equipment to reach. Yeah. Sorry, Guy. Okay, no, no. Um, that sort of leads me into the next question, if I may. Um, just conscious of the time. Um, we've got... Um, Use case for recovery of people from structurally damaged buildings are interesting. How do you see the cage drone photogrammetry versus LIDAR on spot the dog panning out? Um, can I ask Aviad that one, please? Sure, we do see them working together. The, um, it depends on the goals. So there are several limitations on, on the four leg robot, but there are several limitations on a drone. Just as an example, from the weight point of view, uh, a spot robot can, can carry up to 14 kilograms. Most of the drones are much more limited on the weight. Same for the battery life uh, and same for indoor kind of uh, data capture where drones are uh, more limited today. At the end of the day, we see them working side by side. Um, accuracy is another topic. The um, um, terrestrial scanner like X7 get this 3 meter, meter accuracy. 
something which is very difficult to get from a, um, a lighter uh, for, on, on top of a drone. So it really depends on the use case. Both of them are valid um, kind of uh, solutions for specific type of work. Sure. So, well, th thanks for the uh, thanks for the reply on that one, Robert. Um I've got one. I've got one more question, and thanks, Derek, for the last um, Derek Lawrence for the, the last two questions. Um, Derek makes the point: this is expensive tech. How about taking the car approach, lease and balloon payments? Have you had? I'm all for it. I, I don't have any all issue with this kind of business model. I think we'll see it in the market. Um, I don't know what about the yeah. guy or I think it's certainly possible. Yeah, actually, the leasing model or even uh, pay per square meter or pay per project, uh, robot as a service, is, was our first approach. However, uh, the feedback that we got from customers uh, was uh, tell, tell us how much it costs because they figure out the ROI fairly quickly themselves. And even if we offer the service at half the price of uh, human labor, uh, they still understand the value of uh, owning this equipment and, and basically we got a lot of uh, market feedback when we talk to potential customers about uh, uh, actually acquiring the hardware. So, But we are very uh, for it, this model. Sure. Okay, well th thanks for that. Um, I've got a few more questions here that I'd like to try and get through in the last few minutes. Um, Max, this is for you. This is a question for you initially to start um, start us off. Um, do you see a synergy between um, between robots and BIM technology? I know it was touched on a little bit in the session, but um, do you see a synergy between um, the, the robotics and BIM? So with any robotic application of technology, um, one of the key things is spatialization and localization of the robot. For it to be able to perform a task, it needs to know where it is in the building. And inherently, um, if the building has been built to specification, aka as per the BIM model, then the robot should have no issue of localization. But there's always going to be obstacles on site or something might have been built out of tolerance. So the robotic system's got to be able to adapt and understand its environment, but also be able to figure out where it is, um, whether this means the robot starts in a known starting location and it works away from that, or whether it can scan its environment and determine to a high degree of probability where it's physically located within the building. But uh, if you're wanting a robot to go into something that it's never seen before, that's a different application of the technology, but equally there is huge potential. And I see probably from a surveying point of view, that's an even more valuable area of robotics, being able to get into a building that you don't have a BIM model for and produce a three-dimensional representation such that uh, you either take control of the building or you're wanting to maintain it, being able to understand what's there and have the robot A, provide a scan, but also be able to see maybe what's changed what's degraded, what's broken, um, and then be able to do a risk assessment or a, a cost assessment on how much it's going to take to put things right. So there is synergy. Um, if you're wanting a robot to operate in an environment, a BIM model would be very useful, but it's not the be all and end all. Okay. Guy, can I ask the same question of, of yourself? Yeah, I totally agree with Max. And actually, one of our core technology that we've developed is uh, just around the, the ability to perform a real-time uh, segmented model of the indoor structure that we work in. Uh, we cannot rely on BIM. There is always difference between the, the reality, uh, which is, by the way, in the building keeps changing, uh, even though you have a plan, and, and the actual plan. And, uh, and we're currently not relying uh, on BIM for the actually uh, work or very, very accurate work of the robot. But if we do have BIM, uh, it's a bonus for, for the oper for uh, anyone who's, who'd like to do a BIM uh, to, uh, as built comparison. But it's not part of the, uh, the actual uh, requirements of our robot. So yeah, th there is a, any robot that works in a non-sterile environment. One of the key factors for uh, success and, and doing its application is the ability to digitalize the the world and uh, and have a digital perception of the world in real time. 
and not just uh, point cloud or mesh surfaces, but actual uh, models, segmented models. And that, that's, uh, that's an important uh, key factor in, in robotic technologies working in, uh, in real world. Sure, sure. Okay, um, I, we've got more questions here, but I'm conscious that we're, we're at the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour. And um, I want to just move slightly on for those that want to get off after the hour. We have got another um, session planned here to carry on. But if I may, uh, just bear with me a second. Um, yeah, continue the conversation. More questions. We have got more questions. We'll carry that on. I want to thank, um, very quick thank you to Aviad, to Max and Guy. Um, thanks to all the attendees and all the questions. Main session, another session next week, same time. Um, thanks to the sponsors. I mentioned the beginning O2 Business and Rebim. Um, next week at the same time, we've got class of your own, uh, the next generation. Uh, for those that have been with Commit, last few years will have seen Alison and her team. Um, so come along and uh, participate in that one. Um, and the can following I, week we've I, got... Um, sorry, Stuart. Um, the yeah, class sure. of your own, yeah. highly, highly valued. Um, really recommend it. Bring along as many of your team members as you can. Um, what these kids get up to in just a short period of time is phenomenal. Um, I, I was lucky enough to go along to the finals last year and watch what the uh, the school children were pro uh, producing and had produced in a week. It's phenomenal, yeah. and equally, some of them had been looking at robotics in construction. So, sure, really, yeah, I was going to mention. I was going to mention that because there are potential opportunities there as well. And I will I will talk to Aviad after this session uh, and see if we can continue that conversation as well. Um, so thanks, Max, for that, for bringing that up. Um, 24th of July, we've got Blocks and Mortar and, and Blockchain and Digital Twins. Um, that looks an interesting session too. And of course, on the 31st, we've got the vision of real-time uh, construction monitoring. So um, yeah, so three exciting sessions in the next um, several weeks. Um, so just moving on to the next one, um, if I can. Always ask this question. Webinar recordings available on the website. If you can't find them, just drop me an email, and I will uh, I'll take you to the right place. So we're we're here. Um, we're in the um, um, we're in the um, in the bar, the lock-in. Um, we have got some more questions. Um, I'm not going to show that video because it seems the bandwidth isn't sufficient today. Um, so my um, what I will ask is the next question we've got here is. Um, what are the main challenges with adopting robotic technology in construction? I know, Aviad, you touched on that again in the session, um, but can we can we sort of put at the front that the main challenges, the main issues with doing it? We've heard a little bit about cost um, and 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 scalability. I know from your slides you, you presented there on the um, uh, one of the largest general contractors, Hansel Phelps. Um, I know a little bit about that that work. Um, that that to me um, shows confidence in they put it on a large project. But what what were the main challenges, um, or what are the main challenges, and what challenges did they face when they set about using um, using the robotic uh, system on large projects? Aviad, can I ask you that, please? Sure, I think there are several factors here. Uh, the first one is certainly the the maturity of the technology. I, I mentioned we're in a journey. It's not yet the full vision we have, and it will take um, uh, some time till we get there. Uh, certainly exciting, and the, the smart thing to do now is to understand the limitation and, and identify the workflows where we can deliver. Um, but if I will talk about full automation, it's not there yet, and it is a challenge. Other challenges, uh, maybe less trivial, are the, the robotics human interface and how they communicate together. It sounds like uh, trivial, but what we experience in the field that People react to robots in very strange ways, and robots typically don't react to humans at all. And we need to start to develop some kind of communication between the two sides. Humans need to understand that the robot can see him, that it can kind of uh, take into consideration that someone is standing there, and all this stuff can be done using the right uh, um, interface, um, but uh, still there is some work there. And I think the last topic is to um, identify how multiple robots can work together. Our work at the moment is focused on single robots performing a task. 
but I do want to see them collaborating, a swarm of robots working together and different types of robots. We mentioned drone, wheel robot, uh, four leg robot, uh, cranes, in order to really perform something more meaningful. Uh, I think we can, we can see the start of this in other industries, for example, with the automotive industry, autonomous cars already communicate with, with each other in order to improve and deliver more efficient stream of, of uh, driving experience. We'll see the same stuff happening with, uh, with robots in construction at the end of the day. Sure. Guy, do you want to jump in on that one? Because I'm, I'm sure you've had some first-hand experience of, um, of setting, the, uh, setting the thing to work. Yeah, I agree with Aviad, and basically all the points you mentioned are challenges on the side of uh, of the product, of how to develop a better product, and we see this as well. I mean, there is no challenge, and, and people often say that the construction industry is very conservative, and it might take time before they will adopt uh, changes or uh, new technologies like robotics, but I think they are they are ready for it, and and everyone is basically ready, but they're ready for for a good product, something that can really bring value. They're not ready for uh, a beta or uh, uh, something to, to do maybe demo or a pilot, but they're the actual the industry is ready for the actual product. Uh, they're craving for solutions to uh, improve productivity, to improve safety. Uh, we see it all the time. Just they tell us, just you know, bring bring the robots on. And of course, we're still developing the product and, and making it better. But the challenges are, are are lots of challenges, but they're all on the side of the technology and improving the technology, making it better, uh, making it safer, uh, making it more user friendly and collaborative. So I think uh, I agree with that. Yeah, all the challenges are or on this side, on our engineering side. Sure. Th thanks for that reply. Um, Max, anything to add to that before I go to the next question? I'd say. Um... Robots are only as smart as the humans that program them. Um, they cannot react to everything in the world. So there will be situations where robots will just stop awaiting input from a human. Um, and it's understanding, as Avi had mentioned, uh, the culture and the psychology of how humans react to robots as well as robots react back to humans. They are, at the end of the day, a glorified hammer. If they're not applied correctly, they're not going to be utilized correctly, and you're not going to see the benefit of them. No, no, true, true. Okay, so next question I've got here is what what is what is your forecast? Um, this is Tavia, what's your forecast for the adoption of robotic technology in construction? Now we've seen examples, but when when is it going to take off? When is it going to happen? Tavia? Yesterday. Please. Okay, good. <laughs> I saw the video. <laughs> yeah, it's already there. It's, it's really about uh, identifying the visionary uh, organizations who are willing to yeah, take some pain in the process, but reap the benefits of being you know, among the first and getting the competitive advantage and understanding about how the organization should adapt to this new environment. So this is ready to start implementing, not perfect, but ready to start. And uh, along the way, things will improve dramatically. But I, I really think it's it's we are we are already there. Good, good. Guy, do you want to um, come in on that one? Anything to add? No, You're I agree. Already it's, doing a, it every day, it's a gradual you? process. It's a process. It's not a one. It's yeah. not going to happen in one day in particular. It's happening no, no, right now. No. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, so I've got I've got. Um, I've got another question here, which I'll just kick off, and um, it, it sort of goes down the route of technology trends. So synergies between robots and, and other technology trends. Can you think about how the, the, the robots and, and existing technology trends, but but sort of um, you know scanning the horizon for other things? Do you think you know it, it, are robots going to be able to um, help with with future developing technology. Aviad? Yeah, it's you know it's, it's pretty rare to see one technology changing an industry, but if you take a, a kind of synergy between a new a set of technologies, you can see the impact. And specifically for robot, I think we're in a point where there are, um, there is a set of supporting technology which can help accelerate, starting, for example, with the industry move toward prefab. Prefab is certainly 
a more um, a kind of uh, supportive environment for robots. And I think that uh, moving from a construction site to an assembly site will really help us in, uh, bring robotics to the full extent. So prefab is one. Beam we already discussed. Machine learning and AI ability to understand and add, add to this edge computing, understand in real time what's happened and, and, and kind of responds immediately. Uh, things like 5G, we're all talking about 5G. 5G will do a dramatic change here because it allow much smoother communication between remote users and the robot, robots and other robots, and as amount of information that can be delivered to really process meaningful um, kind of output. Um, I think there are more, but um, digital twins as well, of course, uh, kind of a robot as agents who are constantly updating the digital twins. So, a set of technology which works together actually at the moment to help accelerate uh, robotics uh, as part of the vision. Sure, sure. Max, do you want to uh, come in on that? Uh, I think I just need to clarify. Um, that's, uh, one of the things that people see, um, things like Spot and from Boston Dynamics, uh, they, they see those as robots um, and they completely neglect some of the robots that they already use on a daily basis, things like printers and plotters are robots. They take inputs, they create an output based on a set of programmed rules. And um, there are fantastic uses and uh, use cases of robotics being used. Um, there was a project that we were involved with as Fulcro back in 2009 to deliver two floors of a teenage cancer hospital in the centre of London. And through the use of a Trimble Total Station, which is a robot, um, we were able to upload a 2D floor plate showing all of the holes that would need to be punched into a uh, concrete slab in order to put the 10 millimeter drop hangers in to hang all the mechanical electrical and plumbing services traditionally that would have been laid out and projected up from the floor by draftsmen and on-site laborers we used total workstation and two cherry pickers the first chap went around with a sharpie marker and wherever it pinged a laser he marked with a sharpie marker on the roof the second person went round with a robotically assisted hydraulic jack um, with an impact driver to drill that rod at exactly the right position. So something as simple as a total station is still a robot. And we saw a massive benefit of using that. I mean, we knocked six months off an install program just by using a total station, well, two total stations on this job. And that was a two-story hospital re retrofit, but that was in 2009. And we're still not seeing it as commonplace in the market. Um, so no. there are things out there, there's technology out there that really should get used more um, without having to look too far into the future at multi-legged robots doing laser scanning and as-built modeling. There's tools out there that need to be used today. Sure, sure. Um, I, I was involved in the, um, um, the, the system-wide, not the project itself, but the system-wide um, fit-out of the uh, of Crossrail the semi-automated drilling machine. Um, if you looked at the task where they had, I don't know, quarter of a million bolts to drill, the only real alternate was to, to semi-automate the process. So, so it was a series of Hilti drills um, that, that sat behind some uh, learning algorithm that was able to drill. How many, sorry, what was that? What were you showing me there, Max? came out and insert, did all yeah, the bolts so, simultaneously. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, so they relied on a scan for the inside, the, the inside of the uh, tunnel, took out the individual sizes and where the steel sat, and then they could actually drill it. Now, I don't know. Somebody suggested that if they'd done it conventionally, they'd still be drilling now, and and um, and that's some two years after after it should have finished. But um, that, that's the sort of thing. And you're right. Th these things have been around for quite a long time. But I think um, you know, as, as as things progress, we need we need to develop the technology as 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 has been demonstrated here today and take it further forwards and, and and use it for for me the mundane processes um the things that that, that put people to ri at risk um and, and and the jobs that people don't want to do um because they are quite hard i mean if anybody shoveled concrete or put plaster on a wall it is a hard job to do um and there are better ways i mean laying bricks there's the we saw the example what five years ago i think when it came out it might even be longer which was um the semi-automated mason that can lay bricks it can't lay it any better than a, than a conventional brick layer, but it, it, it turns up for work every day. It doesn't go on holiday. It's not a member of of, uh, of a union. It's not sick, um, and it doesn't complain about stuff. It just does. If you if you feed it with bricks and mortar, it will lay. 
Um, and and yeah, things have been things have been advancing. And I'm sure, Guy, you've got this down to a fine art, and 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 you can put put a a, a full size building up in a week. You know, it's uh, it, it, the possibilities are endless. Um, so uh, let me ask you, let me ask you, Guy, the last question, uh, or sorry, the, the the question I asked of, of Max there, um, the synergies between robots and, and and tech trends. Have you got any thoughts on that? As as uh, we have no more questions, so. I think if I if I ask and, and we finish on that, what are your thoughts on on robotics and tech trends, future tech trends? I, th I think Aviad and, and Max uh, uh, described it correctly, and and we can look at robots uh, generally speaking as a glorified uh, hammer, but uh, we are focusing on you know the the next step of robotics, on the revolution, on the technology revolution of the last uh, decade or so of uh, autonomous uh, robotics or autonomous vehicles. And trying to have a, a machine that is still a robot but has the ability to uh, make up its own uh, its own decision or do the what we call the path planning uh, autonomously or automatically and not rely on a human programmer uh, like in the cases that described to to perform tasks. So this is like looking a li little bit further into the future. It is required when you're looking at some a little bit more uh, complicated tasks, like the one that we're trying to automate, which is uh, handles some physical wet materials and things that are changing very fast. So, uh, and and the the the, the great uh, achievements in, in the last uh, few years were uh, basically the sensors. Which are much better and much cheaper, and allows us to do what we do today. So, uh, and and the sensors are going to be better and better. So this is uh, the technology advances that uh, to cost uh, to, to where we are today. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, have you had anything else to to, to add? Um, we, we've not. We no more questions. I think we're coming to coming to the close. Um, any no, any thoughts and comments? It's an exciting journey, and I really encourage everyone to join. It's uh, it's certainly fascinating. So feel free it to contact us. Have any questions afterward? Sure. Okay. Well, I've got a couple to follow up on as well. There's there's been a a couple of people that have um, fired questions in, which um, I'll share with you afterwards. Um, um, searching questions, but um, okay, great. Max, anything else to add before we close off? Two things. Um, I highly recommend uh, people go and have a look at Guy's website, Okibo. Um, the, the, the videos you have running on your masthead are phenomenal. Just watching a robot plaster is one of these mesmerizing things. I remember when I first started down 3D printing route, I'd spend hours just watching the printer. It was great to watch, <laughs> but, uh, um, but what I'd really say is um, in the current state of the world that we're in, especially with a global pandemic at the moment, um, one of the key things, as we saw in the questions at the beginning, was around uh, the a, a appeal of robotics for productivity gains. And with the need to restart the construction sector and things to really get the economies driving again, Robotics being leveraged correctly now could really give a leg up on the productivity across our sector. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Aviad for putting the session together. Thanks, Guy, for supporting. Max, thanks for being on the panel. Um, thanks to everybody that's, uh, that's that's joined today. I know quite a few have left, but we've still got quite a few left in the uh, in the bar. Um, we'll see you on the next one. The video will be available shortly. Um, Thank you. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.